So I'm not going to talk about viruses. I'm not going to talk about uh, biotechnology. Although uh, if uh, you have a um, question afterwards, I'd be happy to answer this question. I'm going to talk about um, uh, what we call the Global CASA Partnership for the 21st Century, long title that we shortened into GCP21. And I'll try to explain to you what GCP21 is and what we intend to do in order to give you a sort of broad perspective about uh, the crop and about um, where we are and where we should go. And first of all, I'm very pleased to see so many people. I was not expecting to see so many people at Cornell talking about cassava. So uh, thank you very much for uh, coming and probably because of the investment made by Ali and Gates Foundation here. Uh, it's probably um, and the reason why I'm here actually. Part of the, of the reason I'm coming here is to make you aware about this, but also to invite some of you maybe to join the bandwagon and to, to work on cassava. Um, when I went to Africa in 74, I had no idea what cassava was. If you don't know what cassava is, is um, the crop we use, the roots from, to make tapioca. So many people here in America, they know tapioca. I had no idea, and I realized very quickly that this is a very important crop. And although I'm a plant virologist by training and by profession, I, by 88, I switched to plant biotechnology because I realized we could use biotechnology to control viruses. And I decided to do this into cassava. At that point, I realized how difficult it is to transfer knowledge and science you know, from model plants, tobacco, for example, to cassava. And um, I also realized that if you are perseverant enough, you're going to succeed. So it took me 25 years between the idea and um, the fields we have in, uh, in, in Uganda and Kenya today, but the transgenic cassava plant looking normally, are growing, and hopefully they'll become um, the first transgenic cassava product for farmers in Africa. Okay, back to GCP21. I decided last year, after 40 years of bench work, I decided that uh, if I had not accomplished something in 40 years, there was no need to go to 41 or 42 or 45. But I realized also in the same time I started to develop this 10 years ago, and because I was so busy with the other project, I did not really do anything with this GCP21. So I decided to switch job, and for almost a year now, I've been uh, going around the world to talk about this in order to um, get the community more around uh, this and to make potentially a change in the crop. I, I chose this image because I like very much, first of all, it's an image coming from Seattle, it's well done. It's a, it's a root of cassava. And I put this molecule on top because I'm, I'm a firm, um, firmly convinced that we've got to inject science and technology in this crop. If we do not, and you are a good example here, this is what you are doing. But we need to do this 10 times more if we want to really express the potential of the crop. Potential is phenomenal, and I'll show you this in a minute. So GCP21, the idea is to, first of all, to bring up a vision of what this crop um, it is today, but what this crop could be tomorrow. I think the, the vision, the prospects are very, very uh, great for the crop, but we're going to have to work very, uh, very hard in order to come up with this. Now, if, I'll give you a few numbers about statistics first of all. Uh, this is uh, where cassava is being produced in Africa. First of all, cassava comes from this part of the world and this part of the world, but mostly this part and was introduced in the rest of the world in the 16th century and thereafter. But now 50%, actually 55% of cassava is being produced in Africa. It's grown in 105 countries, all tropical countries all over the world. And this number of countries is increasing and the production of cassava is increasing. Now, cassava is the biggest, uh, Africa is the biggest producer, but if you look at the, the yield, this is the lowest in the world. 10 tons per hectare, the average is 12. 19 in Asia. So obviously we are not doing the same thing in different parts of the world and this is what we have to think about and change. If you look in terms of surfaces being cultivated, look in Africa, 12 million hectares to produce this 50% compared to the rest of the world. So people are compensating low yield by a lot of space, which is not really the future. So I've spent a lot of time looking at statistics since 1960, 61, since we have um, some statistics. They, they are worth what they are worth, but they're the only one we have. What you see is Asia constantly has improved the productivity of cassava on a regular basis, more than, than Africa. Interestingly, Latin America 
has been really staggering <coughs> all these years. And the reason is lack of investment and lack of interest. Now, Africa is compensating the production by the surface. And you see this, Africa is producing now more than the rest of the world. So the increase of production is very steady and will continue in the coming years. Now, the world of production of cassava is very heterogeneous. If you look at this different example, <coughs> The average is this, 12 tons in the world. Look at India, 36 ton. But remember this number, I'll come back on the number, but this is really amazing. Africa, I put a couple of examples. Angola, Malawi, Angola, average, and Malawi, 20 ton. My point is that there's a lot of diversity in terms of how we grow cassava, what we produce from cassava. And of course, if we could produce 36 ton everywhere, I would probably not be talking here today. So <coughs> now if you look at the rate of development, which is not necessarily the highest productivity, but how people improve the production of their crop, you would be surprised to see that Malawi and Angola for the last uh, 10 years or so, or 15 years, have been improving more than India or Cambodia or Vietnam. So this is showing that things are not static and they are not forever. They can change, they can change sometimes very quickly. And of course, we need to learn from Angola and Malawi, what are they doing that other nations in Africa are not doing. Back to Africa, this is the, this curve, the <coughs> accumulated curve over time. And the production, although the production increased tremendously, 350%, I mean, compared to rice, it is really maybe half of rice, but it's very important for a tuber crop. But most of it, 200% comes from increasing surfaces. So when you know that there is urbanization going on in Africa, you have less and less people in the countryside and more and more people in the, ci in the cities. I mean, this is not going to go forever. At some point, there will be a rupture. So we need really to uh, think about this and see what we can do. Now, if you, if you extrapolate this to 2050, I mean, 2050 simply because we all believe that that's going to peak uh, the, the peak of the, the population in the world. We don't know what's going to happen up to 2050, but at least we know that we're going to cap you know, 9.5 billion people and 1.2 in Africa. You know, if you keep going, extrapolate the, from the past to the future at the same rate, changing nothing, we will be at 15 tons per hectare in Africa by 2050, which is not even what we have today in Asia. Now, if you do the other calculation, which is you know, how much do we need cassava in Africa to feed this population, and that's easier to calculate, actually. This is the blue curve. We're going to need, four, we're gonna need 426 million tons instead of 152 today. But to get this, if we calculate the space, the surface is not being expanded dramatically more than 20% in the coming decade, we're going to have to reach 30 tons per hectare. So we have a big difference. If we don't do anything, if we don't change anything, we go 15 and we're going to have a deficit even for cassava. While we need to go to 30. How do we go to 30? Knowing that uh, some countries are already at, at 30 tons per hectare. So one of the, the philosophy that I, I want to bring here with this GCP 22, 21 is, um, is to put together a number of different people. And I can exemplify why uh, that is needed. But Basically, you have the scientists, you guys, and, and people working in, in the field in Africa. And then you have all the developers, you know, the bank people, the people involved in putting in action uh, stuff. And then we have, of course, the farmers, the producers, and the processors and consumers. In Africa, 90% of cassava produced farmers are also processors and consumers. Now, in Asia, 90% of farmers are only farmers. They are not processor and producer. The impact of this is tremendous in terms of which cassava genotype are we going to grow? What qualities, traits do we have to have in this particular genotype to satisfy the customer? And the customer is different. Situation is more complicated than this because in Africa we have hundreds of tribes and not every tribe is processing and producing the food the same way. So you have variation in all of that. But that's a big, big issue. The fact that we have not considered enough the farmers, producers, and, and consumers in Africa for the last 45 years since we have this international research effort is conducting to what I would call 
a failure um, in terms of cassava improvement, simply because we did not take enough in consideration what the consumers want. So that's a very important element that will retrofit into any scientific program, any improvement of cassava. The other reason is, is also we, we have no link between all these different categories of, of, of people. When the industry is making starch and about 300 different products from starch, you know, they are not talking to scientists to see which plant do we need to breed to come up with the best quality or quantity of starch in order to satisfy their demand. So we need to establish this, this connection, and this is what GCP21 is doing, and I'll show you an example later. Cassava is poor. It has always been qualified as a poor farmer's crop. And if you keep this in mind, it means no investment, no science, no education, no school, no s nothing specific for cassava. You just take a stem, by the way, cassava is grown with the stem. So you take a piece of the stem, you throw it in the field, it's gonna grow. And uh, thank you. Um, but there is no science. I used to say that um, there is more science in the broccoli than you have in cassava. And the reason is not just uh, an image, it's simply because we run at some point a meeting where I invited a number of different breeders for several crops and cassava to compare what these guys' tools um, they use. And it, it's so very amazing what we can do today in broccoli and what we do not do into cassava. And broccoli is feeding a few million people best, and um, cassava is feeding almost a billion people in the world. So we've got to change our mind Cassava is not a poor farmer's crop. It is a fantastic opportunity for poor farmers that we need to uh, expand the, the potential and exploit this potential. So what do we need to do? To be very simple, what, what I propose is on one hand to push science into cassava as much as we can. Today we still do not know if what we call a cassava root is, is not a root, by the way. So it's a, it's a storage organ. What we still don't know you know, the mechanism behind this. We still don't have access to the genes that are very important to fill this special organ. That's bizarre, you know, maybe you, you feed a billion people, but you still do not know how the plant is functioning. So this is reality, this is what cassava is about. And I'm not talking about technologies even worse than this. There are many tools, we don't have yet uh, DNA uh, technology to recognize all these cassava genotypes in place. We are talking to put it in place, but we don't have it yet today and yet it's very difficult to recognize that. So low investment in science, it's a genetically very complex crop. And we know that we have two genomes together. We just got the first you know, sequences of you know, 2009. We have now more sequences, but we are still at the infancy of genomics for cassava. So we're gonna have to address this genetic complexity if we want to decompose cassava and recompose cassava, which is the future for a major improvement. We have no seed system in the world. So if I was, if I am in Nigeria, if I have a luck, luxury to get like 20,000 hectares, I cannot go nowhere to buy the seeds, which are cuttings, uh, to plant in my plantation. It does not exist. So you have to go to a research station and they have like a couple hectares and of course you cannot do this. So it's gonna take five years for you to grow from two hectares to 10,000 hectares. No seed system means no improvement, no quality control, no checking for diseases, for exportation, etc. Does not exist. Can you believe this? We have this for all the flowers that you buy here in any shop, you know, coming from all over the world, including roses and, and uh, orchids and everything. We don't have it for plant growing, feeding a billion people. So that's the sort of thing that we, we need to address and we need to change. And this is the sort of thing that uh, GCP21 will try to change. So what are we going to do? Well, first of all, we will three types of uh, activities. The first one is is trigger, organize, stimulate research and development at the global level, looking for gaps. Where is it that we are not? What is it that we are not doing that could pay off very big in 10 years, 20 years from now? This morning, I talked several times about the seed system. Today, it is possible to make what we call artificial seeds that are somatic embryos embedded into a capsule. And you can do this practically, and you can have a bag of seeds, clonal propagation seeds. You know, this is what the, the pine industry is using. Why don't we use this for cassava? If we were to use this for cassava, you would change completely 
the crop and the cultivation of cassava in the world, you would simplify by 20 or 100 a number of different disease problems. So that's the sort of thing we need to look into. Where can we make a big change, do the research, the development, have an impact in the shortest time possible? We need to invest, transfer modern science into cassava inviting top lab like here. So one of the goals here uh, coming in Cornell is to give you a glimpse of what's going on in cassava and invite you to go to other meetings so you can um, maybe learn more and make um, collaboration, contact, etc. Or maybe we can organize specific meetings on specific topic to see how we can transfer science. I'm a strong believer of what I call the pipeline concept. You know, Africa will not have any time soon the resources and the population in science that are needed to make the crop of 2050. So we're going to have to tap into other resources. Most of these resources are here, North America, or in Europe, or in China, maybe. But we've got in Brazil. But so we've got to establish this pipeline to make sure that you know, we can benefit from the investment made in these advanced countries for this poor crop. And finally, we will uh, develop a lot of communication. Communication means meetings, large, big, small, um, brainstorming meeting around a specific question. And I'll give you an example of this. <coughs> but it means also establishing databases of information that everybody can access on the computer, uh, to have more websites by the cassava, to have access to knowledge, publication, know-how, contact of people. Who should I contact to work on ABC, on flowering, etc.? That does not exist. There are about 26 different databases today you know, related to cassava that I could count on. None of them are complete. And, uh, and far from being complete. So we've got to address that question. We've got to do way more from this. You, I mean, you all understand that today, you know, this is um, an incredible possibility, an incredible um, opportunity with the internet uh, to get the rest of the world access to knowledge. So we'll do that. Um, now, um, I don't want to enter into too much details about what we call a CG system. It's a uh, international centers in the world that are supposedly, I mean, they have about eight to 10,000 employees and they are supposedly working on 36 or 31 different crops, including cassava. So a huge, immense organization, but an immense goal as well. So they are in the process of reorganizing this. And uh, this is just to show that we are very closely <coughs> working with this reorganization. Actually, we signed two days ago an agreement with what we call RTB. RTB is root and tuber and banana for this organization. So GCP will link with the international system, the national system, the industry, the developers, and the farmers association as well. And this is going back to my diagram where I want to put together a number of things. OK, back to cassava and Africa. This is Madagascar a couple of years ago. I went to do a survey on, on cassava. But these numbers have nothing to do with Madagascar, just simply an, exam an illustration of the population. A lot of young people. Each time you go at a school at noon, you see thousands of kids pulling out of school. This is very impressive. OK, remember this. If you produce less than 10 tons per hectare, this is poverty per family. This is poverty because you don't have enough calories to feed your family, or just barely enough. If you produce 15 tons, you have too much calories. You have to use the excess for animals or for local market. There is no local industry or barely none uh, on, on cassava, based on cassava. 15 tons. 20 tons, this is a cash crop. When you produce 20 tons or above per hectare in India, you make money. You have a house, you have a dish on your house, you send your kids to the university, and you are happy. So look at this 10, 15, 20. Remember my previous number I showed you? In India, 36 tons. There are almost twice as much as this already. So it's not impossible. My point is that I'm not talking about an unreachable target. I'm talking about a perfectly reachable target, a reasonable target. But for some reason, it has not been done in Africa and many parts of the world. It has not been done because we have what I call a cassava poverty circle. Because farmers have no money in their pocket, they cannot buy input 
and therefore they cannot improve their yield. And if they improve the yield, there is no industry to take the extra, and therefore it collapses. As long as we are not going to break this circle, the, the, the cassava will stay, uh, a poor man's crop will stay in the poverty um, arena. So we need to break this circle in more than one way. I'll show you one. I'll show you one that I know very well because I'm a virologist and I spent <laughs> decades working on cassava viruses. Now, if we were able to eradicate viruses from all cassava in Africa, we would save at least 50 to 60 million tons of food per year. If that does not ring a bell, this is almost two-thirds of independence of the African continent for food. So, you know, one type of disease, one crop, if we were able physically to clean that up, because Africa could, could save two-thirds, 60 percent of their food security tab. For this, the second effect is if you remove viruses, you go easily from 10 ton to 30 ton. This is what viruses are taking. We've done a lot of experiment in the field. I've done epidemiology and many other colleagues, and we came up with these numbers. And this is not just coming out of the blue. OK, this is the example. These diseases only exist in Africa. They do not exist in the rest of the world yet. Exists in Africa. One is called CMD, cassava mosaic disease. And this is typical viral disease on the leaves. And you see this is a, a, a case where young leaves are completely distorted, etc. Cassava brown streak disease does not cause very much symptoms on the leaves, but cause this sort of symptom on the roots. This is cassava roots that are cut at uh, harvest time. And these roots are not uh, eatable by people nor by um, animals. You only have one solution, which is to throw it away. So this disease, CMD has been in Africa forever. I mean, not forever, we don't know, but first record was 1894, and then gradually invaded the whole continent. By 1950, it was everywhere. So this is costing about 60 million tons of food. And this one is very uh, interesting and very strange development. It was first identified and, and described by scientists in 1935 in East Africa, and then sort of disappeared or was you know, difficult to find. I could not find it myself in 1976 when I went in Kenya on the coast where it was supposedly present, could not find any plant infected. Today, it's everywhere. In Tanzania, in Kenya, in Mozambique, in Malawi, in Rwanda, in Burundi, in Uganda, etc. But it's only in East Africa. And both of these, um, so this is you know, seven different Gemini viruses. This is two different RNA viruses today. So two diseases, but a lot of viruses behind this. Now, they are both transmitted by white flies. And uh, what happened for the last, uh, let's say, 20 years in East Africa is an explosion of insects. And we don't know why. We don't know. They, some people say it's a different species, but that's always an issue with this particular insect. But they are genetically different, that's for sure. And now, instead of uh, finding five or 10 insects per plant, you're going to find hundreds of thousands on one. So the consequence of this is that these guys are responsible for exploding this disease, which was almost disappeared. Now, this is frightening because um, this is happening right now in Africa, but it could expand further and it could uh, promote the development of new diseases. So going back to GCP21, what are we doing? So last May, I got um, about 40 people in a nice place in Bellagio in Italy. And I asked this question, can we prevent Brown Street to reach West Africa? Simple reason, because Nigeria is producing 20% of cassava of the world. If it reaches Nigeria, it's going to be a human catastrophe. You will see this in CNN. Can we decrease the impact of cassava virus in Africa altogether? And can we prevent brown streak and CMD to spread in the rest of the world? Because there is an increased trade business. There are example, well, other examples in other crops where similar diseases have finally invaded the world. All the genetic material for cassava grown in South America, in Asia, everywhere else, but Africa is susceptible to both these diseases. If it was to come in, in Thailand, it would be an incredible catastrophe in a very short period of time. 
this was a question that I posed to these 40 experts. And the question was, are we going to do something about it? And if yes, what are we going to do? So um, first of all, in no time, this group of people who were representing uh, various scientists, developers, donors, etc., cetera, uh, an eclectic but representing group, um, the first thing is we created a global alliance to declare war on cassava viruses. And so this has been uh, published uh, all over the world, I mean sent all over the world, and, and now we are calling on, on people to um, join this global alliance. Secondly, we, we spent a week to write what would it take if we declare that war, how do we conduct, we drive this war? What do we need to do? And we went into a lot of details about what could be done. So surveillance, diagnostic, resistance to viruses, but also to the insect vectors, and, and pre measures to prevent these things to appear in other places of the world. Uh, and if they do, immediately reacting, etc. We are publishing now this roadmap. Now we're going to go to the next phase, which is enlarging this global alliance, and then developing a plan of action. Who is doing what and where, and what is not done? And what is not done should be done by somebody. And then, of course, funding this uh, necessary action and executing all of this. So it's, it's just the beginning of a long process. But um, if you want to simplify the idea is to get a team of people, a, a large team of people, and to be aware and to contribute to the same goal, which is to decrease or limit the spread, decrease the impact of this, and prevent it to go in the rest of the world if we can. So that's one action. The translation of this is, you know, when we look into surveillance and, and climatic change, Wi-Fi breeding, etc., everything down to economic value, we decompose this in a number of different actions. All of this is being described of what we mean by this. And this is the job of the next, next meeting. For number one, who is going to do what and where, and how can we improve the system if we don't have a good surveillance system, which we do not, how can we set one up and, and make it more efficient, etc. This will identify gaps in research, development, application, in order to potentially um, decrease this. I put a special uh, case for this because I'm going to talk more about this in, in a minute. and. Um, this is developing a surveillance system. Today, we don't have a surveillance system in Africa. We do have a number of scientists working in different places, and some of them have knowledge to say, oh, this is brown streak, or this is a white flag. We don't have a tool today to recognize for sure 100% if it is what we call a superabundant white fly or a normal white fly. This is being developed to give you an idea about where we stand in all of this. So it's far from being um, you know, in place and, and, and efficient. And we need to uh, develop it. So what we have done since um, this meeting in May is um, you probably also understand that Africa is, a, is um, composed of French-speaking countries and English-speaking countries. And believe it or not, but even in 2013, language is a barrier. And we don't talk that much to each other, and um, with a few exceptions. <laughs> And, and it's really a problem, and a problem going up to funding. There's not much funding going to French-speaking countries versus to English-speaking countries, simply because um, there are more funding coming from you know, uh, foundations in North America, USA, et cetera, and there is not that much in the French side or the French-speaking side. So first of all, I, I, I went there and I, I talked to, because I'm bilingual, I could talk to these French people and say, you know, have you considered the possibility to participate to this? And of course, after a few meetings and a few months, they said yes. And this is where the situation is. I uh, point to something that I come back later. This is a small island called La Réunion. La Réunion is a French island. We have many islands. We own many islands in the world. But you will see that this one is very interesting, <coughs> very far. But that's, that's the advantage. <coughs> but this is the situation. This is where Brown Street is, for sure. There are some. Um, question marks here, and this is where these super abundant white flies already are. When you see these white flies here in Cameroon, you say, oh my gosh, you know, this, this could come. So because they, uh, the white flies are the, 
the, the responsible for the transmission of this. Now, if you look at the French-speaking countries in, in yellow and the English-speaking in green, thanks to the Gates Foundation and USAID and others, there's quite a bit of activities going on in East Africa in terms of surveillance, diagnostic, etc. But there is none going into <laughs> this part of the world. And this is the gap between the two. So it's very important that we do have in place a surveillance system, especially here, before the gate of West Africa and Nigeria. The sooner you can identify this white fly or brown fly, the easier it is to eradicate and stop the disease before it gets out of hand. Right now, there is nothing. So we started to work on this. And we have made a, um, a network of, of African people working in these African French-speaking countries, as well as French-speaking scientists who are interested into viruses, bacteria, and white fly. Not only interested, they have competence. I'll show you this later on. And hopefully, uh, now we apply for funding. And hopefully, this will come up and structure the first um, beginning of this surveillance network. <coughs> now. Um, Going back to GCP21, I just use this as an example to give you an idea about what sort of thing we can do. So that was uh, the first thing I do in, in May. In June, with IIT in Tanzania, we work on another topic, which is a consequence of what I just talked about. The brown streak is wiping out a lot of what we call land races, cassava land races, simply because they are susceptible, so susceptible that they die. So these farmers have been growing by 90% of them are growing what we call land races. We have no idea where they're coming from, but this is what they like, this is what they grow, and they disappear. So the question was, is it worth keeping, preserving? The answer was, immediately the answer was yes. So we conducted a special meeting for this in June, and in this meeting, 10 countries were represented, and we came up with a sort of protocol on how to collect information, how to collect these land races, how to identify them, where to put them. So we have two gene banks in, in Uganda and in Tanzania using the same protocol. And by the way, I'm doing this. Why don't we do DNA fingerprinting so we can recognize which one is which, et cetera, and have a much better system. And by the way, we will now extend this to West, to Central and West Africa next year. So ultimately, we can improve the whole gene bank system for the crop. So this is an example where we take advantage of a dramatic situation, which is disappearance of these land races, and we take advantage of this to put in place a system that will benefit the whole crop. Now, um, a month ago, I, I ran another meeting to give you another type of example of what GCP21 can do. And this is on the other end of, of my drawing, which is pooling product. Nigeria is the biggest producer of cassava in the world, 52 million tons in 2012, 21% <coughs> of the world production. And the first thing when you use cassava, the first thing you do with the roots, you peel them. You remove a portion of the roots, which we call the peel, which is the, the skin outside plus another um, part of the flesh, and you remove this, and typically you throw them away. Well, too bad, because the skins, I mean, the peels are very rich in uh, oligo elements, uh, in proteins, they have about twice as much protein, in fatty acid, etc. So they're pretty good, but we just throw them away. So um, when you produce 52 million tons, it's about 7 million tons of peels that are thrown away. So the idea was, simple idea, simple question, could we not use this peel to feed animals? If you don't know, if you know Nigeria, Nigeria has a booming population of 160 million people. There's a huge demand for chicken, for eggs, for gold, for fish, for all of this is skyrocketing. And right now, all of these animals are fed with food, feed coming from, imported from Europe or from North America in great part. So, you know, could we not use this to supplement part of this? So I'm, I was not saying that was the solution. I was just asking the question. It took us three days. In three days, the answer was yes. You, absolutely, we need to do whatever we can to save save million tons of food. I don't know if it's going to happen. Now we've made a roadmap. 
we said we need to investigate, you know, uh, the cost, the, how rich it is for this and that. We need to do pilot projects in different parts of Nigeria. The private sector was here, and the private sector at first, day they one, they say that's goofy idea. Day three, they were already contracting to buy peels, to give you an idea about the, the reaction of the private sector. I'm not saying it's going to happen. I'm saying that if it does happen, even at 20%, we're going to save a million tons of food. I don't know if you have an idea how big it is, but a million tons of food is a lot of food. So that's the sort of things you know, that we, we need to think about, sort of global or macro scale, not only on the research end, but the whole chain, and to see where can we fill the gaps, where can we identify gaps, and where can we fill the gaps. It is known for 30 years that we can feed all the animals with this cassava peel. This has been done. But it has never been turned into a business. Why? Because you needed somebody or an organization to think big. You needed the minister. The Ministry of Agriculture was behind this, this meeting, so I visited them many times before we organized the meeting, so they put their weight into this. And if you know the Minister of Agriculture of Nigeria, you understand what I'm talking about. And then we needed to get the private sector to come in. So it's a sort of a combination of people to convince these people to spend a week around a specific question. And yeah, I'm not saying it's going to work all the time, but it, but it worked for this time. So all of this is work in progress. This is not yet solution. But you open avenues, and you start to get organized. And, and potentially, some of that will. Well, the, the land races, they already started to put this into collection. So that's going fast. Now, this is just to give you ideas about other things we can look into. Uh, I put here Cassava Academy. There is no specific um, training, educating, education of relative to cassava. Cassava is, is taught in a million different places, buried into many more different courses, etc. So the idea is that you know, we're going to need the next generation of scientists and developers and businessmen, etc. Why don't we create a sort of a, an academy or a specific course for this? And so we don't know yet. That's going to be 2014. We're going to look into this. What's the best way to do this? Is it valuable? How can we do this? Now, um, Casella is now presented. I'll show you a big couple of slides later. But it's now presented like the, the, the crop of the 21st century for uh, three or four reasons. The first reason is because it's already drought resistant in a very special way. When you get a drought, which is long, Cassava will drop the leaves, and then you get just the, the stem in the field. But when the rains are coming back in 30 days, the canopy is back. And the cassava will use the energy in the roots in order to build this canopy again and to be functional again. This is an incredible uh, physiological, biological property that uh, we need to take advantage of. Cassava can be grown in very high temperature. There is no major issue if you grow cassava at 40 degrees Celsius or more, which is not the case for many cereals, for example. Soybean will collapse you know, at 35 or 36 or a little higher. Um, and, and then the last advantage is the response to CO2 level. We know already we grew cassava in Illinois in the middle of the field of Illinois with this ring system where we could uh, measure the, the response of cassava in four months. And so far, it's the best example of all plant tested. So we know that the plant will respond very well. For all this reason, cassava will be very good, will be a, a potential savior of uh, the African continent uh, because of these properties. So, but we need to take advantage of this. We need to invest more in science, in prediction, in software design, and all of this to make it a tool. I'll show you a couple of slides to illustrate this. But today, we just have a a few maps, that's not enough. We need to really use this as a very sophisticated tool to figure out you know, where and how we're going to grow this 426 million tons of cassava by 2050. And so on. There are many other problems. already talk about this um, the seed system. I could talk about uh, um, the root storage uh, biology and, and, and molecular biology of these roots. We don't know. Uh, anything about this. Uh, so there are many topics, there are many gaps that we need to fill. And this is why the scientific community in Cornell and other places is welcome and will be, will be needed in order to contribute to this. Let me show you these this maps. These are only, I would qualify them or, 
raw maps, because this is really the beginning of a new field of, of science. This is done at, at Cali and SIAT uh, by Andy Jarvis and his, his group of people. And what they are looking is, is taking uh, crop per crop uh, for developing continent for tropical continent and figure out you know, where and uh, where will be maize at risk in, in 2050 if we count a two or three degrees temperature increase and knowing the diseases, etc. Where are we going to be okay and where are we going to have problems? So if it's blue, it means yes, because uh, the corn will grow, it will be very nice. If it's pink, eh, it's not very good. If it's red, really bad. Bl uh, white means no change or absence of data. So you see corn 2050, it's mostly pink and red. This is cassava, mostly blue. For what I told you previously, we already know that this plant will react way better to all these different elements. Now, what I meant by improving the system is, for example, if you look at uh, Angola and, and, and Zambia, and uh, Angola is highly populated, but 50% of the population in the cities, who is gonna grow cassava in Angola to feed this other 50, 60, 70%? you know, in 2050. So we need to do a better job. In Zambia, there is nobody. Okay, you can grow cassava, but if, you, if there is nobody, what's the point? So this blue will be meaningless by 2050 compared to this pink here in Nigeria where you're gonna have 375 million people to feed. So we need to use this, this knowledge to refine this to the point where we can turn them into tools predictable tool for developers to see what has to be done in order to respond to the demand. If we don't do this, what we're gonna see, we're gonna see population migrating, people will go where they can grow food, <laughs> and that's gonna cause a lot of trouble. What we also do is look at pests and diseases. Cassava being uh, vegetatively propagated, pests and diseases are really very important. They are major constraints for the crop the production in general. And viruses, I showed you already, but we have insects, we have mites, we <coughs> have um, mealybugs, I mean, there is a bunch of things. And so we can always use, we can also use this software to, to, to calculate what's gonna be the case for these white flies in 2050. And we know that situation is not improving, the situation is getting worse. The risk is that this white fly not only will propagate what I showed you, but they will pull out new diseases and new viruses and maybe other insects will take advantage of this. So we know that on one end, cassava will be the savior of Africa. On the other end, we know that it's gonna be tough and there will be a lot of challenges. That means that we need to invest into, you know, a plant pathology, for example. We need, there is very literally no entomologist working in cassava anymore, very little. So this is putting us at risk, knowing that we're gonna get many more insects in the future. I will finish this, um, this presentation by showing you a few pictures coming from La Réunion. La Réunion is this little French island in the middle of the Pacific Ocean. And I did not know a year ago, I went there, I, I knew some virologists there because of you know, reviewing their papers and all of this. And I was just looking at this, and you know, they are getting better and better. And there was really, um, so they invited me to you know, a few PhD students to, to get their PhD. And I went there for the first time a year ago. And I discovered beautiful center in the middle of nowhere. This is that center. And it's called 3P for Plant Protection Platform. And what it is, is a, a center with about 120 people. And their job is because of this isolation, is to host bugs coming from the whole Indian region, Indian Ocean region, and part of, of Africa. And they have all the tools, all the knowledge to do this job. And they have a lot of scientists, technicians, students, etc. And all these logos are showing connection, funding, etc. All of this is French based, connected to French at best to Europe. None of this is connected to America, Gates Foundation, USAID the rest of Africa. So, and I saw this, I said, do you know that <laughs> there is another world here um, going on? And this is where it is again. Oh, my arrow switch in between, but it's here. Not very far from, from Africa. And as a matter of fact, they started to work on, 
on cassava viruses. But they have experts in white flies, in bacteria. Bacteria are still a big disease for cassava. And, and all these viruses, but they do not work on cassava. So after a few months, <coughs> I think they are convinced that uh, this is a very important crop. And they are now uh, willing to work on cassava. They will organize very soon a meeting in La Réunion to show their, their place and to make this place available to the community. Say, OK, you know, we are ready to collaborate, to uh, give part of our uh, expertise and knowledge to work in this, uh, in this field, in this arena. So a few, uh, a few slides. Um, they have a, you know, even P3 quarantine labs. This is the, the, the plans with the different types of uh, P2, P3 storage collection. Amazing, absolutely amazing. This is a list of uh, the people working there. It's not like a small lab with two or three people. I counted more than 120 people working in that place with all this expertise. And when I saw this, I said, this is fantastic. That's going to be part of the milestone number one of this roadmap that we talked about in Bellagio to fulfill this French-speaking network of surveillance, training, students, etc. And this is what the proposal is now. They work on genomics and epidemiology of emerging plant pathogen. And cassava is perfectly for this. And they work on other ecological aspects. All of this has been paid by the European community. And all of this French scientists and technicians are paid by the French government. In other words, with a small investment in you know, funding project, we can get a big return. So this is an example of the training they form. They, they, they train people from the private sector to the universities to diagnostic tools up to masters and PhDs. There is a local university. And they would dream to work with Cornell or any other university in the US. So this is a sort of a, uh, achievement they are doing. I show all of this to give you uh, a glimpse on uh, something that you know I was not even aware of myself. And um, I discovered this, and I realized uh, how, how much this group can contribute to uh, the problems I showed you before in Africa. Now, it remains to be seen how this can be done. But um, potentially, we, um, <coughs> La Réunion could be used also to propagate cassava. They have farms, they have uh, <coughs> different plantations where um, it's a tropical climate. There is no cassava, there is no cassava bugs, and therefore it's ideal for uh, propagating uh, cassava to clean or cassava to exchange, which is a big problem right now to exchange material between South America and, and Africa. Here is a potential uh, development, and this could. Um, you know, uh, help the European community to fund more because the European community is not funding cassava very much. Uh, they were 30 years ago, but not anymore. Somehow they, they step away from cassava, which was like a poor farmer's crop, so there was not really an incentive to do this. It's coming back, it's coming back about because of this uh, crop of the 21st century, because of investment <coughs> like this. So if we could put all of this together, a number of administrators would be happy to justify the millions and tens of millions of euros they are spending in the middle of nowhere. And I will finish this by um, one of the activities that GCP21 has been doing is to organize every three years a large Kisteva meeting. The first one was in Ghent, Belgium. It was in Ghent because uh, my friend uh, Baron van Montagu, uh, <laughs> who I know for a long time, um, I, I, this is where I got the, the first inspiration to make biotech cassava, uh, biotech plants. And so I wanted to recognize uh, his input, on, at least on my, on my program. So I organized the first meeting there. My idea was also to attract the, the donors from, from Brussels. That did not work very well. <laughs> so we're going to have to work more on this. The second meeting was in Uganda, because Uganda, with this brown streak issues, these diseases, and all the activities of the Gates Foundation going on, etc., we felt like this is really the heart where we should have that meeting. And the next one will be here. So this is Guangxi province. And Guangxi province is very um, 
known and specific with these rocks in the middle, I mean, big rock mountain. And this is not uh, rice or cassava. That's cassava everywhere. Guangxi is where they cultivate and produce about um, uh, 8 million tons of cassava. And all of this goes to processing, industry, factory, stock. They even import stuff from uh, Thailand, Cambodia, Laos, Vietnam, etc., to feed their system. So I thought this is a, at the other end of the spectrum I was showing you. You know, these guys have a vision, a very different vision about cassava. But I think we can learn from this. I visited three weeks ago a factory which is processing 6,000 tons of cassava per day. So I don't know if you have an idea, but this is a lot of food <laughs> in one day. So anyway, take note of this, but we'll send a lot of information. And um, uh, it's not going to be cassava alone. It's going to be cassava and sweet potato and yam. The reason is simply because there are two organizations in the world dealing with this sort of uh, meeting. One is GCP21 for cassava. The other one is called ISTRC, International Society for Tropical Wood Crops, which is a society, global society. And we collided last year in 2012. We had both a meeting in Africa, one in Uganda, one in Nigeria, about three months apart. We felt it was not really a good idea to do this again. So this time, we'll do it together. And, uh, and maybe every six years or so, uh, we, we can reconsider this. So take note of this if you are interested, if you want to know more. And you can ask, there is a number of people in the room who were in Uganda uh, to give you an idea about what you can learn and do um, in a meeting like this. Thank you very much.